Good evening, Beulah. Good evening, Beulah. We ought to have some reasons to praise God. If you have a reason to praise God, praise it. Well, those of you who don't have a reason to praise God, I'm going to loan you three of mine. He's been good. He's been good. Yes, Lord, he's been good. Let's have church, Beulah. Good evening, Beulah. Y'all looking good out there this evening. Now, come on, let's stand for the reading of God's word. There, there was a man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these things. The, the miracles and all, unless God be with him. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into his mother wound a second time and be born. And Jesus answered, Very, very, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not. I said, you must be born again. Yes, sir. Amen. God's word for God's people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Yes. And the Bible also said, let the light so shine that men may see your good works. Now, what we're going to sing tonight is this little light of mine. And I want y'all to let the light shine tonight. And help me sing this song. This little light of mine, singing, I'm going to let it shine.
Let us pray. O oh, merciful and wonderful God, we come before you in a humble fashion, thanking you for another day's journey. And we're so glad about it, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for waking us up this morning. Some didn't wake up. And Lord, we just thank you for the ability to get up as well, clothed in our right mind. And Lord, we just thank you for having a light to shine, Lord. And because we have a light, we need to let it shine, yes. as the song said. And Lord, we just thank you for your mercy. Thank you. We thank you for your grace. Thank you. And we thank you for your love, thank Lord. You. And because you love us so dearly, we need to love one another. Through the Holy Spirit, Lord, let us show caring and love to people that we come in contact with. Because, Lord, we are blessed to be a blessing. Yeah. And because we let our light shine, Lord, we can bless so many people. Yeah. We thank you for this revival, Lord. We thank you for the first two nights. Yeah. And Lord, we know that you have a word for us tonight. And we just thank you for it coming before us through the evangelist, Lord. We thank you for Dr. Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson being here, Lord, and just breaking the bread of life with us. We thank you for our pastor, Reverend Jerry D. Black. We thank you for what he does for us each and every day with this congregation, blessing us in a mighty way. And Lord, we ask that you would just pause, we just pause right now to ask you to bless the sick, those that are afflicted right now. And Lord, we know that you can be a restoration for them, Lord, if it's your will. We ask a special prayer for those going through bereavement, Lord. And Lord, we know that grief doesn't just turn on and off. It's a process. But Lord, we ask that you would just comfort in the midnight hour where they may not know where to turn. Let them turn to you, Lord, for love and comfort, Lord. And Lord, we know that we are blessed. We're blessed each and every day as the Deacon Jordan opened up saying that we are blessed and you have been blessing us. But guess what, Lord? You are you're gonna bless us today and you're gonna bless us in the future, Lord. And we just thank you for your love and we thank you for your mercy and we thank you for your grace. And Lord, we know that when praises go up, blessings come down. And you say in your word, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men and women unto me. So let us do our part tonight by doing the lifting. And we know that you'll be doing the drawing. We thank you for every member here tonight and every visiting friend. And Lord, let us just worship you tonight in spirit and in truth. These and other blessings you ask in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen.
Let all of the people of God who have no problem with loving Jesus say amen. amen. We are just grateful and thankful to God that he has graced us and favored us with another opportunity to return to this holy place, to come into the house of the Lord and to be a part of this closing evening of revival. It is a blessing, y'all. It's a blessing. Amen. And to God be the glory for the things that he has done. Thank you, choir, because I'm numbered among those who's glad to be in the service one more time. We give honor, glory, and praise to our Heavenly Father who has again smiled on each of us who has looked beyond our faults and has again supplied our needs. What a mighty God we serve. Brothers and sisters, we have come, as I've stated, in this final evening of this spring revival, which is the first revival we've had here at Beulah since we were in the grips of the pandemic. Amen. Amen. But God, amen, was still on the throne. And we were blessed, amen, to make it through that awful time and period of the pandemic. And now, amen, we're on this side, amen, and we praise God. Brothers and sisters, we have come into this house, gathered in his name, to worship him. Jesus Christ our Lord. There are times when even the strongest of us need some more encouragement. We need some additional strength to help us on this journey. We need our spirits revived. And this revival has been doing exactly that. Amen and we rejoice for it, amen. We certainly give glory and honor and praise to God for blessing us with such a powerful evangelist, amen, amen. Our friend and longtime brother, the Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson, pastor of the Second Baptist Church of Little Rock, Arkansas, amen. Oh, he's been pouring it out amen and we've been soaking it in amen and we're just delighted to have him with us in this spring revival this faith forward revival has been one that we've been praying for and that we have even pushed back the plates and fasted and prayed that god would bless us amen with a powerful revival and he has done just that amen we certainly want to uh, acknowledge all of the preachers of the gospel who are blessing us on this evening with your presence. Amen. All of the wonderful ministers of the gospel and pastors. Amen. Who are with us on this evening. We appreciate you so very, very, very much. Amen. I want to certainly acknowledge our deacons. Thank you for a powerful devotion. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Certainly, we are always glad to see our mothers. Amen. You are an added enhancement to this revival service, and we appreciate you so greatly, so greatly. Uh, but as I look out, I see so many wonderful members of our Beulah family and so many wonderful friends who have come to be with us in this closing evening of revival. Some of us have been downstairs, amen, uh, to the fellowship hall where dinner was served and have uh, eaten down there. Uh, but you've come back up here, amen, for spiritual food. And we are rejoicing, amen. I want to make mention of the fact that we have a number of sons of Beulah who are gathered here on this evening, amen. And let me ask that all of those who are sons of Beulah, amen, but they are pastoring now, amen. Would you please stand? 
Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Amen. Out there, Reverend Norman Williams. Amen. So glad to have you with us on this evening. Amen. He's over at Thankful. Amen. Baptist Church and amen. Doing a wonderful job. So glad to have you with us this evening. But also we're blessed, amen, with the presence, amen, of Reverend Fred Young, amen, pastor of the Great Bethel Baptist Church, amen, in Alexandria, Alabama, amen. Thank you for being with us again on this evening, amen. Another longtime friend and brother that I will never, ever go fishing with again, amen. One of the biggest crappy I'd ever a hooked and was bringing him in. I told him, get the net, because I won't be able to lift him into the boat, because crappies' mouths are very, very, very tender, and they can tear very easily. I said, get the net so we can scoop him up. He got the net, but rather than scooping and going under him, he hit him. <laughs> Knocked off my crappie. We fished for about another hour, and I didn't say a mumbling word to him. It was all I could do to keep from slinging him out of that boat. Amen. But the preacher preached Monday about keeping your power under control. Amen. Amen. But we're so glad to have Reverend Gibson here. Amen. He's the pastor of the Springfield Baptist Church. Amen. In Atlanta, and we're so glad to have him here. Longtime friend and beloved brother. Amen. But also Reverend Dwan Jackson. Amen. Amen. Affectionately called Buddy because he grew up right in Beulah. Amen. Reverend Jackson, would you stand please? Amen. Amen. We're so happy to have you here. Amen. And he's passing Springfield in Greenville. Amen, Georgia. And we're so happy. And we have been informed that a van came from Springfield. Amen. Uh, our, a number of members came. And let me just ask, amen, uh, that those members who have come with Reverend Jackson, would you please stand wherever you might be? Amen. There they are. Amen. Amen. We are so happy to have you in the house with us on this evening. Thank you for coming. Amen. And blessing us with your presence. Amen. We want to make mention of the fact, amen, uh, that we've been informed that the former mayor of Greenville, Georgia, amen, Miss Charlene Glover, is with us on this evening. Amen. Uh, will you stand, please? There she is, Madam Mayor. <laughs> We're so happy to have you with us. God bless you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are just happy, and we say welcome to all of our Beulah family who are joining us here in person in the sanctuary and those who are viewing as this service is being streamed and going out. Amen all across Metro Atlanta and all across the United States of America and even into foreign countries. And we want to say welcome to each of you joining us in the sanctuary and welcome to all of those who are viewing from other locations. We're just thankful to God for you. And we just want to take this time and opportunity to just ask uh, that all visitors would stand. Amen. And let me just ask Beulah, if every member of Beulah would stand and just greet people who are around you. Shake hands whether you know them or not. Amen. And certainly shake hands with our visitors. Yes!
were a peace of mind. Some situations are going to come in life, as the preacher told us last night. We're going to have not only mountaintop experiences, but we're going to have to deal with them valleys. And oh, brothers and sisters, it's good to know that even in the midst of the valley, we have somebody we can lean on. Not a temporary, but an everlasting arm. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. I've been informed that Reverend William Robinson is here. Amen. From Fayette, Georgia, I believe. Amen. Where's Reverend Robinson? God bless you. Don't sit down too quick. Amen. God bless you. So happy, Reverend, to have you joining us on this evening. Thank you so very much. God bless you. Amen. Amen.
a wonderful testimony 
that since the Lord is the strength of my life, whom shall I fear? For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it is time now for us to come for our offering. And at this time of our offertory period, we are certainly grateful to those who have been so generous in your giving. And we certainly want to be a blessing to the man of God who has been such an immense blessing to each of us. We can't possibly repay him or anyone for the gospel. Amen. But we can express our gratitude and our appreciation to him. And we want to do our very best to do that. And we need you and your generous support. Amen. As we prepare to come now, Father God, bless your people. We pray that you will pour out your spirit upon each and every one. We pray, dear Father, that you will move in such ways that they will know that you are right there with them, opening doors that need to be opened, making ways that need to be made, answering prayers that so greatly need your answers. Father, bless your people now as we prepare to come with our offerings. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, and we say thank you, and amen, amen, amen. Will we all please stand? following the directions and guidance of our ushers who will direct us and lead us. Amen. Let us come quickly.
Amen, amen. Thank each of you for your giving. Would you might stand once again, please? Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Dear Father, we pause once again to tell you thank you. Thank you, dear Father, for your people, their generous giving. Thank you for their support by way, not only of their finances, but by way of their prayers. Father, we thank you now for every blessing that you've showered down upon us, far too numerous to name, but for all that you have done, we say thank you. And dear Father, thank you for the most precious blessing of all, your darling son, Jesus Christ. Now, dear Father, as we go forward uh, further into this revival service, we pray, dear Father, your anointing upon the preacher who will come to preach your word. Father, give him power, give him strength. And Father, give us receptive hearts, minds, and spirits to receive the word as it is so rightly and richly proclaimed. For we pray and ask it all now in Jesus' name. And we say thank you. And amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you so much. I would be terribly remiss if I would fail to acknowledge the presence of our deaconess and our uh, certainly ministers, spouses, thank you. But also that group of warriors who are so faithful at their post, our ushers, we appreciate you so very, very much. Amen. Amen. I want to recognize and acknowledge with gratitude and appreciation some other persons who work with our media ministry, our sound technicians. Amen. Our video technicians, thank you. Amen. Deacon Ronnie Marshall, amen, who uh, manages that whole operation. Thank you so much. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, it's preaching time. Amen. As I've said, since the very start on Monday evening, if there was ever a time that revival is needed, that time is right now. We need a revival. And the hymn writer declared, Lord, send a revival and let it begin in me. We are blessed with one of the awesome preachers of our nation being with us on this week for revival. Amen. He is a longtime friend and brother who has introduced himself to our Beulah Church family. Amen. And is by no means a stranger to the family of Beulah. Amen. Our friendship goes back, way back, as I said on Monday, to the days when we both had afros. Amen. That day is long gone. Amen. But it's a joy and a blessed privilege to have him with us on this evening. He has crisscrossed this nation, preaching and proclaiming the riches of God's word. Amen. And men and women, boys and girls, have been greatly blessed by his preaching. I want us to pray with him and pray for him. Amen. Again, he is the very able pastor of the Second Baptist Church of Little Rock, Arkansas a dear friend, a dear brother, but most of all, a powerful man of God. Amen. Let us, amen. Following this next selection from the choir, the next voice that we will hear will be that of our preacher. Amen. The Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson.
Lord and praise God. There is no one like our God. Hallelujah. 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 There's no one that heals like him. There's no one that blesses like him. There's no one that guides like him. There's no one that protects us like him. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, how we love and bless you and thank you and praise you and adore you. We lift you up and magnify your name because you are worthy of praise and honor and glory and we give it all to you. Father, we confess our many sins before you. Pray you'd forgive us and cleanse us even now from all unrighteousness. Thank you for how you continue to look beyond our faults and see our needs. We're not ashamed to publicly declare how much we need you and we can't get along without you. Now, God, as I stand to proclaim your word, I pray for a fresh anointing, a fresh enablement, a fresh empowerment of your Holy Spirit. Use me now in such a way that everything I do and everything I say will only be done and only be said so that you might receive the glory. Now, will you cancel out every plan of the enemy? Have your way, Lord in us, through us, and among us, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this indeed is the day the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord? The psalmist said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let me take this moment to certainly recognize the angel of this house the shepherd of this flock, the pastor of this church, my friend, your pastor, Dr. Jerry Black. Amen. Amen. Certainly to all of the pastors and ministers who have come out tonight, uh, Amen, Brother Gibson and Young and Buddy and Norman. and You didn't bring your gun, did you? <laughs> Norman, <laughs> Lord have mercy. And Pastor Robinson and so many of the others who may be here that I can't see all of y'all, but it's so good to have each of you to come out and be with us on tonight. And then to say, of course, we certainly recognize our First Lady, amen. Lady Kate, yeah, she surprised me today, and uh, they had me over to the house, and uh, she fed us real good. But you know, uh, one of the seven sins is gluttony. <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> And uh, I think he committed uh, that sin this afternoon. But thank you so much for all of your kindness to us. And uh, it's just a joy to be here. And I want to thank you, Pastor, for inviting me to come. As I mentioned the other night, I believe I was your first evangelist when you got to the church here and uh, back in 93. Uh, Amen. And so here you are 31 years later. Uh, you invited me to come back. I started coming here in my 30s, and Lord have mercy. <laughs> and then Beulah, you are, you have been so kind to me over the years. You come out every time we come together, and I just want to say thank you so much for your support. 
So there is a word I want to share with you found in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 11, and I just want to read a portion of a paragraph into your hearing tonight. Verses 1 through 6. Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Reading from the New King James Bible, if you found it, can you indicate as such by saying amen? amen. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. When John heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you, you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Again, Jesus said to, they said to Jesus, Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Will you look at your neighbor, smile at him or her, and say, it's not what I expected. Yes, sir. That's what I want to talk about tonight. You may be seated. It's not <clears throat> what I expected. I read a quote not long ago that says, what screws us up the most in life is the picture in our heads of how it's supposed to be. Often in life, there is a disconnection between the life that we expect it to have and the life that we actually have. Sometimes this can happen in a negative, in a positive way rather, when the expectations of one's life exceeds what he or she ever thought would come their way. A person in that kind of situation probably says to himself or herself that with all of the odds that were stacked against me and all of the obstacles that I've had to overcome, who would have thought that I would have gone this far in life? Never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined that my life would have turned out this great. On the other hand, this disconnection between the life that you expect it to have and the life that you actually have can happen, if you will, in a negative way. Oh, you had high and lofty dreams and expectations for your life, but somehow life didn't turn out the way that you expected that it would. Perhaps I speak to someone who has matriculated at some college or university for four or more years and now that you look back over your career and what have you, you wish now that you perhaps had majored in something else. Or maybe I speak to someone who has worked on a job for 30 plus years that has left you less than fulfilled. And now that you look back through the rearview mirror of your life, life didn't turn out for you the way that you expected that it would. Or perhaps I speak to some couple tonight whose marriage, instead of it being a relationship of joy and peace, it is more a relationship that causes pain and agony. No, it didn't start out that way. When you were first married, you thought that your significant other was the love of your life. But sometimes if you're honest about it, you wonder now why you ever did it. <laughs> now, if you can't say amen, just look amen. Sometimes life doesn't turn out the way that we expected that it would. Someone has rightly suggested that expectation is the root of all heartaches. Somehow we've convinced ourselves that if life had only turned out the way that we expected life would turn out, that we would be so much more happy, but that's not necessarily a true proposition. Because I know some people who seem to have all of the trappings of, of success in the American dream, and yet they are unhappy and unfulfilled. Sometimes, child of God, life is not going to turn out the way that you expected that it would. And when this happens, you can allow it to cause you to become bitter and cynical, if you will, and, and, and to live a life of bitterness and unhappiness, or you can see it as a teachable moment. 
that can help you to better understand the plans and purposes of God for your life. This is the lesson that John the Baptist, the man in this text that I've read into your hearing, teaches us firsthand tonight. I don't want to assume that you know John the Baptist's story. So permit me, if you will, to give you a cliff note abridgment of his personal history. His father, Zacharias, was a priest, if you will, in Jerusalem. His mother, Elizabeth, was a relative of Mary, the mother of John. Uh, and a and, and, uh, mother of Jesus rather and before John was born John had special written over his life before he was born an angel came to his daddy and gave him a prenatal prognosis of the trajectory of his prophetic ministry the angel told old man Zacharias you and your wife Lizzie y'all gonna have a son you're gonna name him John he's gonna be great in the sight of the people many people are going to rejoice because of his birth and that he's going to cause many people to turn their hearts back to God. The angel said John is going to be a great preacher who's going to come in the spirit of the prophet Elijah who would prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. I mean before John ever got into the ministry he had special written all over his life. John's ministry, I'm sure John's family rather, I'm sure that they perhaps thought that John would follow in the footsteps of his daddy and become a priest like his father. But John rather answered the call of God to become a prophet instead. Or maybe they expected that John would go to rabbinical school like his father. But when John came of age, he chose, if you will, to go out into the desert and live the aesthetic life. Or maybe they thought that John would wear the priestly, uh, go, priestly garments of a priest like his daddy. But John chose to wear the simple clothes of a prophet, a camel's hair tunic and a leather belt. Or maybe they thought that John would be kosher like his daddy and eat the finest of kosher food. But John chose to eat the simple food of the desert, locusts and wild honey. Even before John started his ministry, he had special written over him. And John's ministry didn't begin in a fancy pulpit. No, John started preaching out in the desert. And he preached fiery sermons. He preached a message that told the people that the kingdom of God was at hand. That the kingdom of God was imminent. And that the people needed to repent of their sins and that uh, as a sign that they had repented that they needed to be baptized folks started coming out into the desert to be baptized by John matter of fact he baptized so many of them till they gave him a nickname they called him the baptizer John was preaching and the more John preached the larger the crowds grew John was the hottest ticket in town all oh, brothers and sisters unlike the other scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders John didn't sugarcoat his gospel no John didn't sure he wasn't afraid to speak truth to power and the, and the common people loved him for his bravery but it was precisely his bravery that got him in trouble with King Herod John had the mit unmitigated gall to tell Herod that he was wrong for marrying his brother Philip's wife Herod got mad and had John thrown into prison. From that moment on, John's ministry began to spiral downhill. No longer would the huge crowds gather out in the desert to hear him preach his fiery sermons of repentance. All he could do now was languish in that dark, dirty, danky dungeon cell. At first it was for weeks and the weeks turned into uh, to months and for almost two years John who had once been the talk of the town was languishing in a prison cell for all practical purposes he must have felt irrelevant he must have felt that he had been taken out of the game and I'm sure that John said to himself this is not what I expected 
John didn't expect his ministry to end with him being thrown in jail. He fully thought that he and Jesus would have gone on a preaching expedition, a partner, a tag team relationship, and he would be the opener and Jesus would be the closer. But no, for almost two years, he's been sitting there in that dark, dirty dungeon cell. He said, this is not what I expected. While prison was a terrible ordeal for John, there was a silver lining, and that was John was permitted to receive visitors from time to time. And John was particularly interested in knowing what was happening on the outside and particularly what was going on in the ministry of his cousin, Jesus. Remember, before John went to jail, G John had the privilege of baptizing Jesus out in the wilderness. And when Jesus showed up at the baptism, John declared, Behold! the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So John wanted to know what was going on in the ministry of his cousin. Well, his disciples said, well, John, you remember how large those crowds used to be that came to hear you out in the desert? They said, well, John, the crowds that's coming to hear Jesus are much larger. And John, unlike your harsh, in-your-face message of judgment and the impending doom of God, Jesus is preaching a slightly different kind of message, a message of mercy and forgiveness. And John, Jesus, is showing compassion on the people. He's healing the sick. He's giving sight to the blind, unstopping deaf ears. The lame are now able to walk, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. I'm sure John must have been taken aback by this news and he sat straight up and said, what do you mean he is not preaching a message of the impending judgment of God and rather preaching a message of mercy and forgiveness? And what do you mean he's performing miracles for the people? Why don't he come and perform a miracle for me after I've sat here in this jail for months on end? I tell you what, I need you to go and ask Jesus a question for me. Go ask him, are you the one? that we've been looking for or should we look for somebody else John ran into that problem that many of us run into in life that the life he expected to have did not square up with the life that he actually has and when that happens I think this text teaches us some valuable lesson because maybe you came in here tonight and you wondered why your life hasn't turned out the way you wanted it to here's a word from this passage for you tonight and it is this that when the life that you expected to have does not square up with the life that you actually have know this that it is only human to express your doubts some people are taken aback by the fact that john had his moments of doubt you know that this is that this is the same john who said um i, I i'm not worthy to stoop down and uh, untie his sandal laces this is the same john who said now i baptize you with water but he's gonna baptize you with the holy spirit and now john who declared out in the wilderness behold the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world john said are you the one that we've been waiting on or should we look for someone else oh john had his moment of doubt may i tell you something tonight authentic faith is not the absence of doubt in this life child of god you and i are gonna have our moments of doubt our moments where we wonder does god care does god know what i'm dealing with does god is god aware of what's going on in my life does god even exist we're gonna have those moments where we doubt but authentic faith will trump our doubts and cause us to say, despite my doubts, I still believe. I submit that John doubted because of his circumstances. He had heard his disciples talk about Jesus' miracle working abilities. He wondered why the one who had raised the dead had not set him free. He wondered why the one who came to set the captives free hadn't set him free. And, and, and so John looks around at his circumstances and says, this is not what I expected. Go ask him, are you the one? Or should we look for someone else? Can I teach you something tonight? And it is this, when you place your expectations in your circumstances, you set yourself up to be disappointed in life. 
Let me say that again. When you place your expectations in your circumstances, you set yourself up to be disappointed in life. Am I talking to somebody tonight? As you look back through the rearview mirror of your life, you wonder why in the world my life turned out the way it has. You expected surely my life would have gone, been a lot further down the road than it is right now. You said I should have been married by now. Now I'm 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And it hasn't happened yet. You expected that by now you wouldn't be struggling financially. That at this age in your life you have all of your financial uh, uh, business in order. But that's not your reality. And you say to yourself, this is not what I expected. Am I talking to perhaps a pastor? You went to the right schools, you dotted your I's and you crossed your T's, and yet you've been uh, assigned to pastor 40 people while somebody down the street that can't out preach you at all got all the folk in the world. And you wonder what's wrong with me? This is not what I expected. When you place your expectations in your circumstances, you set yourself up to be disappointed in life. He doubted because of his circumstance, but then he doubted because of the Lord's methodology of doing things was different than his. You see, John was a revolutionary. He, he, he like the other religious leaders, they, they wanted the Messiah, the anointed one, to come in a particular way. They wanted Jesus, the Messiah, to be a military leader, a geopolitical leader who would raise up an army and go to war with Rome and set Israel free from Roman domination. They didn't expect Jesus to come born in a manger uh, meek and lowly do I have a witness here and because the Lord didn't do things the way John thought that he should ha have done things he said you go ask him are you the one or should we look for someone else if we're honest about it that's our issue tonight that God don't do things the way we want God to do them you prayed and you were so sincere when you prayed that God would open that door for you but God didn't open the door. You were so sincere when you asked God to heal you, to heal your mother, to heal your child. But healing it did not come. And if you're honest about it, sometimes in those moments when God doesn't act in the way that we want God to act, we have our moments where we wonder, does God even care? But can I teach you something tonight? God is not obligated. To answer your prayer like you want God to answer your prayer why because God is sovereign that means he can do what he wants when he wants to whom he wants through whom he wants whenever he gets ready and you can get mad at God shake your fist at God stomp holler and spit at God but guess what when your makeup runs dry up he's still gonna be God and the reason he's still gonna be God cause he's always been God he didn't run for the office nobody voted him in and can't nobody vote him out Moses said from everlasting to everlasting you are God he's God when mama dies he's God when child dies he's God when you got cancer he's God when you get a pink slip on your job he's God God, and he doesn't need your permission to be God. But can I tell you something else? No is an answer. God don't have to say yes to every prayer you pray. Sometimes God says no. You don't believe me, ask the Apostle Paul, when he had what he describes as like a stake, like uh, being, being driven in his side, a thorn in the flesh. And Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, prayed not once, not twice, but three times that the Lord would remove that thorn. And God told Paul, no, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. 
God says, I'm not going to change your circumstance, but I'm going to give you the grace that you need to deal with it. Look at somebody and say, deal with it, deal with it. Deal with it. But I believe that John perhaps doubted because of the timing of the Lord. The timing of the Lord. You see, John had wondered why he hadn't seen any uh, results of the impending doom and judgment that he had preached to the people when he was in the desert. He quoted from Malachi 3 and 10 and said, the ax is laid at the root of the tree. Every tree that does not bring forth uh, a, a good fruit will be uh, cut down and thrown into the fire. And John, it seems, was wondering why was there any, uh, any visible evidence that that judgment was coming. You see, John wanted judgment to come right now. But Jesus said, not now. For Jesus, the judgment would, will come at the end of the ages. So what you have here is John's right now is running up against Jesus's not now. What do you do when your right now confronts Jesus's not now? You got a right now problem and you want God to move right now, to fix it right now. And God who is sovereign says, I'm going to fix it, but not now. You can't hurry God. I said, you can't hurry God. Uh, uh, um, uh, I know, I know. We say, okay, God, if I got to go through this, um, if I got to go through this fire, then, Lord, put it in the microwave. Get it over fast. And God said, no, I don't use the microwave. I'm old school. I use the crock pot. Some of you young folk don't even know what a crock pot is. It's a slow cooker. He said, but don't worry, I won't let you burn because if I let you burn, I'll make myself look bad. I know when to get you out of it. Two sisters had that same problem. Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Jesus said, you're going to see your brother again. I know in the general resurrection, he said, baby, it's apparent that you don't know who you're talking to. I am the resurrection and the life. I am right now what you're believing to happen in the future. So there it is, child of God. Sometimes the life you expected to have is not going to line up with the life that you actually have. But when that happens, you ought to understand it's only human to express your doubts, to have your doubts. But, but secondly, when the life you expected to have doesn't line up with the life that you actually have, you need to know that your faith in Christ is not in vain. The curious, the curious from John have come to Jesus. They've come with this question that John has sent them to ask the master, are you the one? Or should we look for somebody else? It's interesting that Jesus was not taken aback by their questions, their queries. But Jesus gently and lovingly sent an encouraging and reaffirming word to his friend. And John, who knew the scriptures, would understand his reply. He said, come here, come here, you, 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 you go tell your teacher, go tell your teacher uh, what you heard today. Go tell him the gospel that you heard me preach. But don't just tell him what you heard with your ears, but also tell him what you saw with your eyes. Tell him that the blind receive their sight. Tell him that the deaf are able to hear. Tell him that the lame are able to walk. Tell him that the poor have the gospel preached to them. And then John, who knows the scriptures, will know that what Isaiah said in Isaiah 61 and 1, that it's being fulfilled by me today. That tell John that his faith in me is not in vain. But if we're honest about it, friends, 
There are moments when we wonder, is, does faith matter? Sometimes we wonder, are we on some kind of a wild goose chase? Does faith in God really matter? I mean, here you are, you're giving your tithe every time you get paid, and yet there's too much month left at the end of your check. And you look up and you say, well, where are those windows? He said, he's going to pull me out of blessing. But I wouldn't have room enough to receive. You are, you're trying to live a holy life. Now, none of us are perfect. But at least some of you are trying to live right. You got trouble on every hand. And there's a joker down the street who goes to nobody's church. Don't seem to have a problem in the world. You wonder. Does faith in God matter? And yet our faithful and loving God has a way of coming to us. Sometimes with a sense of his abiding presence. Sometimes he speaks to us through a sermon. Maybe the sermon you're hearing right now. Or through a song that the choir sang. Or he'll send a friend or a perfect stranger who comes at just the right moment and says just the right thing to remind you that your faith in Christ is not in vain. That's why we gather on Sunday mornings, every weekend we gather in houses of worship. We come together in corporate worship because we know that in corporate worship we get a word from God. A word that can lift up our bow down heads. A word that can tell us to hang on in there. A word that tells you not to give up. A word that keeps you from losing your mind. A word that helps you to look at life and all of the vicissitudes and problems and say my faith in God is going to help me to face whatever you throw at me today. If anybody ought to be in church every Sunday, it ought to especially be those of us whose skin has been darkened by Mother Nature's son. Because everything we have acquired as a people in this nation, we got it through the direct or indirect influence of the black church. Don't you fool yourself. It was the black church that pricked the conscience of a racist society and pulled down the walls of segregation. And now you are able to work on those jobs, live in those neighborhoods, drive those cars, make that money. But now that some of us have moved on up to the east side and finally gotten our piece of the pie, we act like we don't need to go to church anymore. Shame on you. This is what got our forefathers and mothers through the debauchery of slavery. It was their faith in God. Do I have a witness? You could hear them, you could hear it in their language. And somehow they believed that a better day is coming. They would sing it. You could hear it in their hymnology. They would say, I'm so glad that trouble won't last always. A better day is coming. Many of those slaves never owned a pair of shoes. They went barefoot all their lives. But they were saying, I've got shoes. And you've got shoes. And all of God's children got shoes. And one of these days, I'm going to put on my shoes and walk all over God's heaven. A better day is coming. Swing low, sweet chap. A better. A better day is coming. That's my message for you. Sometimes the life you expected to have ain't going to always square up with the life that you actually have. When that happens, it's okay to express your doubts. But when that happens, you need to know that your faith in Christ is not in vain. But I go to my seat. Thank you, Pastor, for having me and tell you that when the life you expected to have doesn't square up with the life that you actually have, this text says remain faithful regardless of what happens to you and so the bible tells us the bible tells us that jesus says to the disciples to john's disciples 
in verse, I believe, number six, he said, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Jesus now is encouraging not only John's disciples, but he's encouraging the rest of the people in the immediate audience to remember that our faith in Christ is not in vain. And so in this little beatitude, he said, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. That word offended is a Greek word from which we get our English word scandalized. Scandal, are you with me? It means to stumble. It means to fall away, to fall, to stumble into sin and into unbelief. He said, you go tell John, don't be scandalized because of me. Because living for me does not guarantee you that you're going to live an idealized life. No, if you live for me, you might get your head cut off like John. You might end up on a chopping block like Paul. You might be crucified upside down like Peter. It might mean that you got to pastor that church with 40 members or you have to work on a job that you don't like or you have to put forth effort to try to save your marriage or it has to live with the circumstances that life has dealt you. But whatever you do, don't you stumble. Don't you stumble because of me. I think of Nelson Mandela, who, like John the Baptist, went to prison because of his convictions. For 27 years, a third of his life, there he was behind prison bars, but he never stumbled. He was not scandalized. He never gave up on his faith. He never changed his beliefs. Because, child of God, that's the word that the Lord would have me to share with you tonight. And that is, child of God, that in this life, life will not always turn out the way that you want it to. In this life, you may not live in the house that you think you ought to live in. In this life, you may not drive the car that you think you ought to drive. In this life, you may not make the money that you thought you were going to make. But I've come to tell you that the easy thing to do is to give up. But the God-honoring thing to do is to look up and say, by faith, I'm going to hold on to God's unchanging hand. Can I get a witness? Because time is filled with swift transition not on earth unmoved can stand but build your hopes on things that are eternal and hold on to God unchanging hand can I get a witness we are often tossed and driven sea of time, somber skies, and a howling tempest of succeed the bright sunshine. But in that day, in that land of perfect days, when the mist has rolled away, we'll understand it better.
doesn't turn out the way you and I expected. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have heard a powerful word from the master by way of his preacher. And we thank God that even when things in life don't turn out, the way we had expected. To never lose our faith. To thank God for situations being with us as well as they are. Oh yes. While the Spirit of God is high in this place there ought to be an opportunity provided for somebody to come to walk out to walk out while you still have a chance somebody needs to take advantage of this opportunity and come. If you have not yet accepted Christ as your Savior, come on. But for those who had accepted Christ but you fell by the wayside, he'll take you back. And he'll wrap his arms of love around you walk out there might be somebody else here who says I've been praying for God to guide me to a good Bible based spirit filled church and the Lord has spoken to my heart and told me to walk out or maybe there's just somebody here who needs prayer Whatever the case is, walk out. God bless you, sister. Come on. Somebody else ought to come. Yes. Over. Is there another who will come? Will be all right. God bless you, sister. Come on. Everything. Everything. God bless you. God bless you. Is there another who will walk out? Come on. Say it again. Everything. Everything. God bless you. God bless you. Everything. Is there another? If you're the balcony, come down either of these side stairwells. Or take the elevator down. 
to this level after the storm comes. is over. Pants is over. Everything. Oh. You say. Tell somebody it'll be all right.
Oh. And some folk only shout after the storm passes over. But there are some of us who have an advanced shout. We can shout in the storm. We can shout in the storm. Glory to God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Let's give God praise for this preacher. God bless you. God bless you. Well, it's been good up in here, up in here, up in here. And what a high note to bring this service, this revival, this spring revival to a climax. As we get ready now to make our way to our various homes and destinations, this is the last night of the revival, but it doesn't have to be the last night of the revival spirit. And as we go from this place, there might have been those who came in after the offertory period had ended. And you didn't have a chance to make your financial contribution to be a blessing to the man of God who has been such a tremendous blessing such an immense blessing to us oh yes so if you were not able to give your offering because you arrived after the offertory period our ushers and officials are at the doors to receive your offerings and as we Get ready to go. Pastor Watson, 
God bless you. Bless Janice. Bless the girls. Amen. Bless Second Baptist. Amen. May you continue to proclaim the awesome riches of God's word. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, as we get ready to depart, will you just turn to somebody and tell them, I'm so glad I was here. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. It's not gonna always go the way we expect it. But we can leave here knowing that God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in our times of trouble. God bless you. Father, we thank you afresh for this powerful, powerful spring revival. Thank you, dear Father, that every evening you have used the man of God to bring a word that was so beneficial, so encouraging, so inspiring so strengthening to our hearts. And dear Father, as we go down from this mount, back to the various communities, neighborhoods, and even other cities where we reside, Father, keep your covering over each and every one. Father, we pray that you will keep your hedge of protection around them. Dispatch special angels from heaven so that all night and all day each and every one will have angels watching over them. Oh Lord, thank you Lord now. Yes, my soul says yes, 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 Lord. We ask that the grace of you, our God, the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of your Holy Spirit will continue to abide with each and every one gathered and those who are viewing online. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. And we say thank you, Lord. Amen. My soul said.